you? I'm I'm good. I'm good. It's late here in Bali, Indonesia. But right. the airport. We had a wonderful, a wonderful summit, the East Asian Summit on Marine Debris Solutions, and it was just phenomenal. Right, um, um, I heard quite a bit about the summit. So, okay, can you tell us, um, you know, what's been going on, and you know, what were they talking about, and what, what did you think? I know you've been really excited about the summit. So, can you tell us what is it that that inspires you so much about the summit, and then while you're doing that? I'll set up the video and the uh, the timeline for for your book. Sure. So the, the summit it's the East Asia Summit uh, Conference on Marine Debris Solutions, and it's back to back with APEC. These are two very big conferences. Uh, that's some background. Sorry, I'm in a, a restaurant here, <laughs> about to head to the airport. But the, the conference just ended, and we had delegates from all of Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, from Thailand, Cambodia, from Laos. Uh, here in Indonesia, and, and the summit really, it's a response to, you, you may have seen a research paper by Jenna Jambeck in 2015, where she was the first time looking at a global estimate of which countries were the biggest polluters. And what we found was that, well, what she found, of the top 20 countries, China was first, the United States was last, uh, Indonesia was second, but 11 of those countries, the top 20, were from Southeast Asia. So that got this entire region kind of in an uproar, you know, wanting to understand, okay, this is really bad. You know, it's bad for the image of, of the region. Indonesia recognized they're a second to China, so they, they hosted the East Asian Summit. So for the last, the last two days, it's been conversations and conversations about what do we do to stop the flow of plastic waste from all the Southeast Asian countries to the ocean. We've heard from scientists, from policymakers, from, uh, from the plastics industry, from NGO leaders, like the Mother Earth Foundation, uh, uh, Froilan uh, Grabte had a chance to come visit and talk with some people about some of the initiatives on decentralizing MRFs. You had uh, uh, other countries making their own commitments to improving their, their waste management. And then you had some really interesting debates about whether you know, waste management should go in the direction of energy recovery or much better composting and sorting for recycling. And now I'm in the camp where if you get really good at composting and recycling, then you got these residuals to deal with, and then you can figure out, okay, do we ban these, these hard to recycle products? Do we redesign them? Industry is favoring waste energy for a bunch of reasons, and, that, and there was a lot of debates around that. But I found, you know, what, I, what I took away from this is that there, there are strong commitments being made, that the attention is here to, to stop the flow of trash from land to sea, from a part of the world that has very little waste management and a lot of introduction or, or importation of, of plastic packaging and single-use materials and a loss of that to their, to their watersheds and wash run beaches out to sea. So now I walk away really optimistic seeing a lot of effort being put to this issue in this part of the world. Um, right, Marcus, um, uh, I think um, that's really amazing. And um, I've been part of the um, Ocean Conservancy um, uh, work that was also done on Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And, you know, I was part of the report which did, um, I, I mean, provided many solutions and waste energy was part of it. So, um, you know, um, so I'm like, if you would say then I would be on the other side of the debate, uh, people could consider me on the other side of the debate, but I'm really happy. I mean, I've, I've always uh, loved talking to you and I've been really happy seeing what kind of uh, um, movement this has become um, about marine plastics. And um, I believe, uh, I think you uh, and uh, Five Jars Institute and um, uh, uh, Captain Charles Moore from Algalita, I think all of you had a really huge role to play in this movement becoming um, so big. So um, congratulations on that. And uh, um, it's really amazing to see all of this. So with that, I'll, I'll go to the video. And then you said you could lip sync it. So um, maybe if you could do that. Uh, <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me get my glasses on. This should be amusing. I mean, this video, I should give some context. 
before you play it. All right. Explain what it is. So um, my wife, Anna Cummins, she and I began the Five Gyres Institute almost 10 years ago. And our first big project, working with, uh, with Al Galita and Five Gyres together, uh, don't show the video yet. Hang on a second. Okay, so we built a raft out of 15,000 plastic bottles. We put them into old fishing nets, made long pontoons. And on top of that, we put a square deck made from about 25 sailboat masts that we found broken in junkyards. And on top of the whole raft, this recycled raft, we put an old airplane. We went to the, the craziest junkyard in the desert in California on the airplane, put it on top, called the whole thing, called it junk. And Captain Charles Moore dragged us about 60 miles off the coast of Los Angeles and let us go with no motor and no boat to follow us. And what we thought would be a, a four to six week trip turned out to be 13 weeks, very slowly drifting across the ocean, using those gyre currents to get to Hawaii over 2,600 miles, and in the middle of the ocean, we were running out of food, we were down to eating peanut butter and fish. I, I fished this fish out of the water. It's a fish that I saw being born in the beginning of my trip. And it, it was me and my co-navigator, Joel Pascal. He, he and I were the two sailors, and Anna stayed back at home on mission control. And she was saying, hope you guys catch fish. And we caught this fish, you'll see in this video. When I open the stomach, you'll see what poured out. All right, let me play that. Um, All right, let's let try and lip sync this thing because I know you don't have sound from the video. Yeah, so let me play this. So I'm starting now. So I filleted this fish, thinking we're going to eat it, and here's what I found. It's full of plastic. This is the whole reason that we're out here to bring this to your this attention. Your attention. The plastic the fish won't pass it. The fish plastic won't pass it. Is full plastic is full of organic, organic, organic things like TPDs, DDPs, 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 Right, right. It, it, it made the point that, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and this is going back 10 years, in the middle of nowhere, we were down to you know, eating you know, a few fish we could catch and, and peanut butter and some granola, and here is this fish with these particles that pop out of its stomach. And the particles, as we know, and your audience knows, they absorb all kinds of persistent organic pollutants, uh, many pesticides, even oil drops from cars, any kind of hydrocarbon is going to stick to plastic. Middle of nowhere. And the point that I want to make is that since that point, since that, that fish discovery, we have gone from maybe a, a little more than 100 instances of or papers describing animals impacted by marine debris 10 years ago, now well over 1,200. The, the world is now, we're seeing is contaminated. Our entire biosphere on land and sea is impacted by, by plastic pollution but also the, the distribution of plastics. So what Five Gyres has done, we published a paper about two and a half years ago. It was the first estimate of all plastics, all sizes, and all oceans. And that was, uh, the big number was 269,000 metric tons from 5.25 trillion particles. So looking at these ecological impacts and the distribution, we can say it's all on global. The impact and the distribution of microplastics is everywhere worldwide. So I think we all, we all know that. Enough science has been done to act, and we're seeing actions happening. I, I love the, the, the last speaker uh, just now talking about um, the, the end of landfills, you know, trying to get away from the fact that we dump all, all this stuff. And then you and I could talk, I think, at length about, you know, what do you do with all the residuals then, the unrecyclables? Right, I think, right. I Back up real quick, you know, to here in Southeast Asia, what we're seeing is this is like ground zero for the movement. The break free from plastics movement ha has spawned from industry's reaction to Southeast Asia wanting to deal with their waste. So 
when you get really good at recycling and really good at composting, and the Mother Earth Foundation in the Philippines has, has done this through, this, through, through the, the, the decentralization of MRFs. What that means is, instead of having all the trash have to be transported, all this mixed waste, mm. mixed organics and household waste, all sent in big trucks and a lot of expense and having to pay for trucks and fuel mm. and, and let move to a landfill and dump it. When you take the transportation out of the equation and you do all this locally and it decentralized small MRFs and you employ the waste pickers to go door to door and teach people how to sort their, their materials, let waste pick, pickers keep those recyclables they're collecting from door to door, bring the, all the, 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 the organic waste. What you get is a very efficient system of localized organic composting, localized recycling collection, and you get residuals. And what they estimate is about 30% of the waste stream is, are the residuals. They're getting 70% diversion by doing this. Then you have to ask, what do you do with those, those residuals? And that's where I think is the, the place where we have this great divide. And that's, that's in the book that I have that just came out, The Junk right. About the Draft. My second last chapter is called The Great Divide. Right. And, right. and the thesis in, in the book is why is energy, energy recovery such a big card that the industry is playing as opposed to let's just get really good at recycling and, and organic composting and the residuals, that's where we have to redesign things that don't fit in the recycle market. Right. My thesis is that industry, if they, if they allow recycling, recycling to get really good, imagine if, for example, the United States, we recycle only about 9.2% of our plastics. If they cut it over 50%, that means that this year's plastic, we, we then use it next year. That makes the need for virgin plastics drop tremendously. Industry over the last 50 years has enjoyed this 4% growth curve uh, of increasing demand for virgin pellets. If recycling gets good, there's, there's no need for, or not much of a need for virgin plastics anymore. So I think to right. maintain demand, it's the essence of planned obsolescence. Get rid of last year's plastic through energy recovery and incineration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, great. So um, let's uh, let's then uh, move to the. Uh, so uh, that's the second uh, the penultimate chapter in the book. So let's actually go through the entire book and your experience. Um, you know, uh, which made you write the book. So um, I have the timeline here um, ready. So uh, when you say next slide, I'll move on to the next slide, and you can you know you can walk. walk through. Yeah, we just went through these photographs really quickly, and I'll, I'll tell you about them. So this is. Uh, you can see Anna Cummins and Holly Gray are volunteers uh, moving the bundles of plastics. This is uh, in probably March of 2008, where we're beginning to assemble this, uh, uh, these pontoons. Now, keep in mind, at this time, no one had been to the Western Pacific or the Eastern Atlantic in the North. No one had been to any of the, the, the subtropical gyres south of the equator. And we had some models that told us, you know, that trash might go to the five subtropical gyres. Charles Moore had been to the North Pacific extensively, so that was the setting. We knew very little about how much was actually out to sea. We knew very little about ecological impacts. So there was a lot of room for public awareness, and that's what spawned this, uh, this rafting voyage, why me, Anna Cummins, and Joel Paschal came together to build this raft. Okay, go to the next next photo there, and this is a uh, this next photo is launch day. So the photographs being taken from the dock where we had a couple hundred people up there and many more on the dock behind the raft, and you see all those little bottles lining the edge of the raft. That was our that was our water in stainless steel little canteens. You can see the airplane right there, clear as day. the The raft was heavier than I expected. We had a we had a whole bank of batteries. We were completely off the grid, a very resilient little raft. We had brand new solar panels and a brand new wind generator. Other than that, it was junk, all recycled junk. And, and we launched. So next slide. So 
So that is, and, you, and you'll read about this in the book, our, our first catastrophe was day three. Uh, I stepped out of the raft and into water. The raft was sinking. What I discovered was that the ocean was pulling the bottle caps off of the bottles. So within a few days, and we had a biggest storm that first night, about 50 mile per hour winds, we suddenly found ourselves in about almost more than one foot uh, sunk overnight. So I called Anna and I said, Anna, we need some help. So she, she chartered a boat and she, she found in the ocean and, and handed us about a hundred tubes of glue because we couldn't give up. And we, we spent one day together pulling bottles out of the raft, putting the caps back on, and putting the bottles back into the raft. And I did that every day for about two months to keep that raft afloat. So we kept going. Next slide. And we got down to the, the, the border of Mexico. The raft didn't go toward Hawaii in the beginning. We actually did 800 miles south and never crossed a line of longitude for three weeks. But we got to the border of Mexico, and the U.S. Coast Guard began circling around our raft. And the Coast Guard finally said, okay, who are you guys and what are you doing? They must have thought we were smuggling something you know, in these bottles you know, down the coast. And then once we explained who we are, what we were doing, um, I think that sort of legitimized our case, and we kept going. The next slide. This next slide is, is a very joyful photograph. That what you see behind us is the last bit of land, Guadalupe Island. We we discovered a mini gyre behind that island where uh, the wind. It was, it was all, it's actually called a wind shadow, where the wind would hit the island, and then it, there was no wind behind it. And when our raft got stuck there, we were stuck in the circular current of the waves and wind, and for for almost three days we stayed behind that island making these giant loops until finally we were, we were kicked out, spit out and kept going south. We were very happy. Next slide. This is Joel Pascal. You know, after a, a month at sea, we were uh, just constant repairs, making sure the raft was afloat. Next slide. Joel's a great sailor and a good mechanic and kept things together. And this is our first, uh, our first time being becalmed. So suddenly we get down to the trade winds, about 20 degrees north of the equator, and the raft does an abrupt right turn toward Hawaii. And all of a sudden, we're in this great wind, and we're going toward Hawaii, and we're just rejoicing. And the next day, the wind stops. The wind just cuts off completely, and for five days, we stayed within this 10-mile by 10-mile box, just drifting, going nowhere. All the while, I called Anna to ask for a weather report, and here's what she sent over. Here's the image. Next slide. Off the coast of Cabo San Lucas was the first of three massive hurricanes that formed. And just by sheer luck, we were able to stay about five days ahead of these hurricanes. We would travel five days, and this hurricane, this was Hurricane Fausto, it came and it it died where we had been five days earlier. And then we moved a couple weeks later, the next hurricane. And it came and died where we had been a week earlier. That happened three times. But each time, the hurricane would give us a lot of good wind and uh, push the raft. Now, these hurricanes are forming off of the coast of Mexico, and they're being driven across the equator uh, by the same current, the same atmospheric movements that – that create the southern edge of the North Pacific subtropical gyre. And this weather keeps going along the equator, the north side, until it gets to Japan, and then the, then the wind and the waves kind of go north, and they stay north, come across uh, toward northern California, British Columbia, and then sweep back down south to join these southern currents again. So we, we were riding these currents intentionally, but we were getting later and later in the season in hurricane season, and we're feeling the wind of these big, big storms. Next slide. So then, because we had so much time, we began trawling for plastics. That yellow thing I'm holding is a small sock, fits on a net. We collected maybe, I'd say, 30 or 40 samples. Every sample had small microplastic particles. The typical microplastics you see 
of this issue around the world. We were finding lots of microplastics skimming the edge of the North Pacific gyre. Now, after this expedition, Anna and I began the Five Gyres Institute, and we have found, we've done this exact same work using our nets, little net sock. We have found microplastics in every sample we've collected around the globe, over 700 samples in all five subtropical gyres. But this is one of our first. Okay, next slide. As we progressed, two months later, the boat was falling apart. We had the mast was cracking. We had the stays were frayed. The stays are the, uh, the wires that hold the back of the mast. Uh, bottle capture filling with water. So out, we're out of glue. We're out of food. Um, next slide. We were eating everything that, that we could. Even little flying fish in the mornings, we would grab those and, and eat them, the one I have here. Next slide. Until we caught that, that rainbow runner. Um, this is Joel catching that yellow fish that had the microplastic in its stomach. Actually caught it by hand, not a hook, in a, in a net that he made. And we catch some bigger fish. Next slide. You can see this is one of the big mahi-mahi. Uh, we caught, I think, in total 18 fish in three months. Um, and that was it. Next slide. But then actually what, what saved us was meeting uh, this woman rowing a boat in the middle of the ocean. And it is, it is the craziest story. So Roz Savage is an ocean rower. And I knew she was going to leave San Francisco around the same time that we were leaving Los Angeles. And we talked on the phone, and I said, good luck. Good luck, Roz. I'll see you in Hawaii. Two months later, I'm on the phone with Anna, and Anna says, you know that woman, Roz Savage, in, the, in that, in that space-age canoe, rowing by herself? Well, she's 200 miles from you. We couldn't believe it. We're in the middle of nowhere, and here she is, you know, not too far from us, but we had to meet. First of all, she, she was out of water. So it's critical that she gets fresh water. Both of her water makers were broken, her electric water makers, so we had to meet. But at the same time, my first question to her was, do you have any food? Because we were down to eating fish and peanut butter. So it took us six days to find each other. When we finally did find each other, she, she throws over three bags of food. We made 10 gallons of water. Joel jumped in and found a fish. In fact, the fish in that previous photograph was one that Joel had found. And uh, we had this amazing feast on board this bottle raft. We laughed, took photographs, and two hours later, she was back, back in the boat heading, uh, heading to Hawaii. Next slide. And three weeks later, 800 miles later, we arrived, Joel and I and Roz. Uh, Anna should be in that picture. Uh, next slide. Hawaii. We then took the raft and we traveled uh, up and down the state. We, Anna and I rode bicycles actually, actually did a whole bicycle tour giving 42 lectures and Joel, we met Joel in, in Sacramento at the state capitol in California. Joel brought the raft and we displayed the raft on the capitol steps. So you, you've seen the three of us standing there where we met Joel and at, at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor in California, and his office was maybe 100 feet behind us inside the Capitol. And we also had maybe a dozen different environmental NGOs that joined us. I mean, Surfrider, Clean Seas Coalition, uh, Environment California, California's Against Waste, and we all met, Al uh, uh, Glita came, and we all met and talked about the bag ban, the bag ban in California, really pushing the bag ban. This was, you know, 10 years ago, and I, I'm proud to say with this amazing coalition of NGOs across California, it took us 10 years to finally get a statewide plastic bag ban passed in California. And it made the point that, and, and, and the movement understands this, it's slow pressure over time, never giving up, constantly fighting this battle. Because I can tell you, it, it, it's a war of attrition, and industry recognizes when they can throw in the towel. And for them, it, it, for industry, it, it, it's a matter of how do they want to spend their time fighting a groundswell of bad PR. And, and I know this because I've spoken with uh, representatives of the American Chemistry Council, and they say, you know, like microbeads and the bag bands, we want to focus on other things. So never give up. The slow pressure over time and we can win. 
The last slide is the future of, of, of five gyres in this raft. So the future of the raft is, uh, is gonna be a future science center committed to sustainability. And Ann and I have begun this now, it's called Leap Lab. And you'll see in Los Angeles, come back to LA in about five years and look for Leap Lab, look for the Science Center, and you'll see the junk wrath on display. And hopefully you'll see all around there displays, other exhibits talking about all the wins we have had and how the movement has grown and how the movement of hundreds of organizations is changing how we view waste, how we view plastics. And I, I hope in five years we can, we can all cheer that the culture of single-use throwaway plastics uh, that are polluting our seas has ended. So that's, that's all the slides. And here's the book. I got one copy I've got left here in Bali I wanted to show, to show you. There's the raft on the cover. There's Joel. So this book it just came out two months ago, and it's a, it, it's a really good update on the science. It talks about and some of the winds along the way, about microbeads. Um, the very last chapter is called Revolution by Design. So while we work on some of the policy, um, there's a need for, for innovative minds to create new products, maybe new systems or new ways to deliver products that might not need packaging to, uh, to humanity. So Revolution by Design is, uh, is the last chapter, and it's where I think this, this movement needs to go. It's, it's, it's both in, in, in pushing hard to get rid of that throwaway culture, but then be mindful and, 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 in, and invite the engineers to join the movement. Invite the, the smart minds to change the systems that can deliver those services and goods to people in different ways. Right, that's an amazing story, Marcus. I mean, that is great. Um, uh, this, um, uh, while, while um, looking at some of the slides, it reminded me of a, a research cruise I was on um, in the Gulf of Mexico after the uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Um, and uh, we were uh, we were there to uh, monitor the air emissions from you know the oil spill and what kind of impacts it had on the local ecosystem, and um, you know the flying fish and uh, catching mai mai and all of that. I think those are really good experiences. But I think um, I would really recommend anyone watching or um, that uh, to have uh, to be on the ocean um, at least once because it's a really um, great opportunity to have a spiritual experience. Um, you know, being on a single small vessel in the middle of, you know, great forces in the ocean. I think it's it's really humbling. And um, um, so, yeah, I um, really recommend um, a trip like that. I mean, our, our research cruise, we were, you know, well s staffed and then we had all the food and water and everything. So we didn't go through, you know, the difficulties that you had to. But then I think it still was, um, you know, very, uh, a great experience to be on the, on the ship and, you know, be in the middle of the ocean. Um, so, um, so Marcus, uh, tell us about uh, a little bit more about you know the the last chapter in, in the book, and um, you said it was an update on science. So, and I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking about you know all of this while writing and also while doing the void. So, tell us a little bit about you know the update on science and the last chapter that you have. So, the, the update on science. Now, we're looking at you know this some of the human health stuff that's coming out. Um, but also looking at the ecological impacts. And that's where I think there's, there's a lot of work that's being done. I think the frontier uh, of the science, it's not as much as saying, you know, there is plastic on this beach, plastic on that beach. And a few papers still trickle out reporting, you know, abundances of waste. And that's good to have. But I think the, the most important information we should look at are some of the ecological impacts on whole populations. And but that's very difficult. It's hard to put an entire species, entire population of, uh, of, of, of one vertebrate species in a test tube. It's really hard to make those observations. But it has been done. There's one great paper that was uh, done on oysters, finding that the, the abundance of microfibers in their bodies and the POPs associated with them were causing some, some, some degree of population decline. Uh, their population sizes were, were, were smaller. That... That is where the real harm is. That's, that's I was, not, not the real harm. That's where some of the biggest harm can be. So if a paper describes, here's another fish with a bottle cap inside, or here's a, a turtle that ate a bag. Those are, are, are horrible things to, to witness. 
but they don't they, they don't give you an idea of the harm against the whole population. When you show that, then we can see. I think then you can bring in um, some other uh, policy tools, um, Endangered Species Act, and uh, there are other things that you can do to look at when an entire population is affected. So the frontier is there. There's there's a need for the science in, in that realm. Also, human health. There is a uh, there is talk now about you know, smallest, small particles, nanoparticles crossing the, the, the blood-brain barrier or getting into our blood system and the effect it might have at a subcellular level. So I think some of the human health and the ecological population uh, impacts is, is where the science, the science is now. That's the front line. All right, great. And um, also um, talking about the um, um, collective action. I mean, this theme is about collective action. How you know all of us could you know work together to turn the tide. And um, your book, uh, you do discuss about the rising activism, a uh, tide of activism um, against plastic pollution. So, and uh, earlier you mentioned about you know um, working towards a bad ban in California. So you know, considering all of this, um, do you think you started a movement in California, which could then act as an example? um to other states to you know do something similar because in 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 the us you know that that is uh, that that is how the system kind of works to some extent you know if there is a state which already does this then it's much easier for other states to do it too so um can you talk a little bit about that aspect of you know scaling the movement or um doing the back ban uh, across across the united states to begin with yes i think uh uh I think certainly there are lessons you can learn, not just from California, but from other countries. Kenya, for example, we know they just banned plastic bags across the country. We're seeing, you know, other uh, other instances of EPR legislation happening in in Chile as a good example, where it holds brands responsible to get back uh, uh, their packaging. So I think look at these examples. There, uh, I do have some colleagues who are working on a. Uh, uh, a site where you can go and see all these examples, really spelled out well, so that with any whichever country or community you are from, you can look and say, okay, I want to do a, a a product ban. Okay, here's a community that did it, and here's how they did it. And here are ex actually examples of the policy briefs that they used, images. Here are the videos. Here are the, the media tools. Here's the strategy. So. Uh, I think having a clearinghouse and then a college working on this, we can all go to find these strategies. So in California, for example, our, our bag ban, as I mentioned, was a 10-year effort from you know, dozens of NGOs uh, and individuals and, and, uh, and politicians all working in the same direction over time, a long time, 10 years, to make it happen. Microbeads, I mean, how that happened, it's, it's in my book, you know, step by step from the science happening, the science came after microbeads already being being looked at in Europe. There were already uh, the Plastic Soup Foundation had some amazing tools that they, they created uh, to bring awareness to microbeads. And myself and Sam Mason from SUNY Fredonia, uh, an awesome scientist, she and I, we found the microbeads in the Great Lakes, published that paper. We had the science. We had precedent in Europe using what they were doing successfully and launched a campaign in the United States with an amazing coalition of people. The story of stuff, um, I mean, the list is, is long, and we won. Um, uh, within you know, three years of the, the, of the pub paper being published in the US, we had signing the legislation. So that's the policy side. Then the innovation side, there's a lot of amazing, amazing new, new ways of moving materials or, or, or providing services. I know here in, in Los Angeles, where I live, uh, there's a group called WeTap. They just got a, a, a big chunk of change to bring uh, refilling stations to schools. So I, I know when I was a kid, I grew up, there were water fountains in, in all of the schools. And then they, they became water bottles, and now they're getting back to water fountains. Water fountains with the bottle refilling station. So, so yeah, I think... Um, um, Look soon for a clearinghouse for all these policy tools and these other other interventions and mitigations. Now it's coming soon. Uh, it's a chance for everyone to plug in and share their successes.
Right, and um, so you're saying it's coming soon, so um, it's not, um, is there a link that everyone can go to, or is will that be announced in the future too? In the future. Okay, okay, all right, wonderful, great. Um, and um, so, uh, so, uh, and um, could we go back to the, um, the conference um, that you've just been? So you're done with the conference and you're coming back, so, you know, what are your final thoughts? What are your future plans? Um, are you going to write another book um, sometime in the future? Or, you know, what are you going, are you going to focus on the Leap Lab? If you are, you know, tell us a little bit about Leap Lab and what you plan to do there. Sure, sure. So, so in the future, um, is actually right now we're working on Leap Lab. And that is a science center committed to sustainability and urban resilience. It's focused on, uh, it's a demonstration space for urban resilience. It, it's, it's waste issues, but it's also energy uh, production, food and water security, ecology, community. Those, those are the five themes. But bringing all of, all of our knowledge and experience on plastics into that waste theme. Um, the previous speaker talked about, uh, previous two speakers about zero waste. That's the movement. It's about zero wasting our, our communities, building circular economies. So Leap Lab will be a science center that will show, at least our city here in LA, what a resilient city, what a zero waste circular economy looks like. And actually show people how to do it in a practical, economically feasible way. So that's, that's where our focus is. The right. Lab. At the same time, Five Gyres is still doing you know, amazing work. We have expeditions coming up. And we'll actually be in Indonesia next week working on this. This is a hot spot where I'm at right now. And in this region, um, you, you, there's an effort to monitor uh, closely how much trash leaves land, how much is in the oceans, where it's coming from, going upstream. And if we can monitor and, and detect reductions in river outputs over time, find out what was the mitigation upstream that worked and scale that around the, uh, around the area. Right, and um, I'm going to be at the International Solid Waste Association Congress and um, it's also WasteCon. Waste conferences by SWANA, which is the Solid Waste Authority, the so Solid Waste Association of North America. So they're together organizing a conference in Baltimore uh, this 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 month. So um, they're they're uh, planning to present um, uh, findings from their research on how uh, what role or the potential of uh, improving waste management systems in these countries uh, to reduce marine plastic litter. So I think um, it'll be, uh, are you planning to attend uh, one of those sessions or? Um? I, will not, I will not be there. I got so much traveling coming up. Actually, I, I leave Bali and then I head to Paris for a, a microplastics workshop. But there, there, oh, there's wow. great work. It's, it's pretty amazing to see how this movement has grown internationally. The science has embraced, I mean, brain debris, uh, plus pollution science, it's kind of filled its own now. Using de degree programs, universities, it's, it's amazing to see this move and how it's grown. Hey, uh, Ranjit, I'm going to have to head to the airport. <laughs> uh, no worries, uh, uh, Marcus, we're done. So um, great. Thank you very much for your time and uh, have a safe uh, flight back. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good one. See you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Um, friends, so um, that was uh, Marcus Erickson. Uh, he spoke to us from an airport in Bali, Indonesia, which is why we had um, some uh, background noise. But otherwise, uh, I, I thought that was a, a very good session. We learned a lot from his experience on the boat and uh, on the on the junk raft. So um, finally, friends, so uh, tomorrow we have uh, another session on practicing uh, waste management. And um, we have um, Mani, uh, Mani Kishore from uh, Banyan Nation. He'll be talking about uh, how entrepreneurs could work with informal recyclers. And uh, we also have um, uh, uh, Kirsty Pecky uh, from, uh, uh, from Conservation Law Foundation. And she'll be talking about what kind of uh, information we should know about regulations and legislations. Um, about and compliance of uh, our uh, local waste handling facilities. And uh, we also have other great panels, so um, I uh, welcome you to uh, register for that session too and um, follow us tomorrow. So thank you very much again.
and um, have a good day, good night, and good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and also uh, follow us on um, social media and subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.